In Exodus chapter 4, God intends to kill Moses right after commissioning him to go and liberate the people of Israel from Egypt. What's happening in this story? Why would God choose to send someone that he only intends to kill right after? And why does Moses' wife circumcise Moses' son in order to spare Moses' life? Let's jump into the scripture to see what's really happening in this bizarre story. This is where we find this fascinating story, which seems to make no sense, but there's something deeper going on. This is God commissioning Moses to you know, bring the people out of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I've put in your power. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. Now I want you to notice this. This is what comes before this odd story is that Israel is referred to the nation and this people is referred to as God's firstborn son, right? In a metaphorical sense, they are the firstborn of God. And I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. Well, what if I don't? You know, Pharaoh would probably say, if you refuse to let him go, I will kill your firstborn son. So right when we jump into this story, there's already been some emphasis on the way that God is going to rescue his firstborn at the cost of Pharaoh's firstborn and all the firstborn in Egypt who don't actually heed the, the commands of God. That if you want to be protected from this, put blood on the doorpost, that kind of thing, Passover. It says at a lodging place, look what happens next. This is Moses now on the way to Egypt. On the way, the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. This is very fascinating because it makes no sense from our perspective why God would want to put Moses to death when he just said, I'm going to use you to rescue the people from Egypt. Then Zipporah, this is Moses' wife, took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin. What an interesting response to what seems to be about to take place that God, there's evidence that God is about to put Moses to death. Zipporah catches that, takes a flint and actually cuts off her son's foreskin, circumcision, right? And you go, this is bizarre, man. I did not sign up for this. Just just wait. And, he's, and, and she touched Moses' feet with it and said, surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. I want to emphasize how she focuses on blood and she's a bridegroom of blood to, or he's a bridegroom of blood to her. So he let him alone. In other words, God responds to this action on Zipporah's part and goes, eh, I won't kill him. It was then that she said a bridegroom of blood. Because of what? Because of the circumcision. There's so many questions that I have that I don't necessarily know the answer to yet, but maybe as we study this, we'll figure it out. First of all, why the emphasis on touching Moses' feet? Well, if you go back a chapter... Moses approaches the burning bush and God says, whoa, 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 the place where you're standing is holy ground. Maybe this has to do with the uncleanness, the unholiness on the part of, you know, Moses to be able to approach God on that level and do what God has called him to, possibly. The second thing to consider is that Moses did not circumcise his son. That's a very big deal. And you go, I don't know why that's a big deal because Moses knows he descends from Abraham and the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob made a covenant with Abraham and what God tells Abraham to do with every firstborn is to circumcise his flesh. This is the covenantal sign of what God intends to do with Abraham. God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant. What does it mean to keep the covenant? God will explain. Keep my covenant. You and your offspring after you throughout your generations. In other words, this is not just for Abraham. This is for anyone who would physically descend from Abraham as his children. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring. Notice the emphasis on not just Abraham, but on the offspring as well. What's the covenant? Every male among you shall be circumcised. Which if we know that in the new covenant, you know, this is a shadow or a type that shows us an image of what God does to the human heart. 
He removes our heart of stone and gives us a heart of flesh, the spiritual circumcision by the Spirit of God. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins. It shall be a sign of the covenant between me and between you. So this is a very big deal. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. So the sign in the flesh of Abraham is proof of the agreement that he has with God. This covenant God made with Abraham and his descendants. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh. Because you go, what happens if they don't? Look at what happens. Any uncircumcised male who is not, doesn't honor and respect the sign of this covenant, which shows that they're not in this covenant. Well, they'll be cut off from their people. Why? Because they've broken my covenant. How big of a deal is circumcision? It's the sign of God's covenant with the patriarch of the faith and everyone else who descends from him. Which is why in the new covenant, we actually have the spiritual circumcision of the heart, which is a gift of God's grace that we have that opportunity. But now let me bring you back to the story to show you. Remember how I said, take note of the emphasis on the firstborn as it transitions to this weird story. God says, I'm going to take the firstborn son of Pharaoh if he doesn't let my firstborn son go. So there is a transaction that takes place. Fine. You won't give me mine? I'm going to take yours. It's the just penalty. The loss of life, the shedding of blood, in order to set God's firstborn son free. There's another emphasis here on the firstborn, Moses, which involves blood again. And remember, God told Abraham that whoever doesn't get circumcised, cut off from the people. They are, they've broken the covenant. That is a fantastically huge deal. So why does Zipporah refer to Moses as the bridegroom of blood? That's not a weird thing. It's not a fantastic nickname for your, for your spouse. But the reason she does this is because the emphasis here, the emphasis is on the blood that was shed, right? When her son's foreskin was removed. It's a cutting off involving blood. And it ends up, this act spares Moses' life. Let's think through this. You're telling me Moses disrespected the Abrahamic covenant? Didn't honor it at least enough to have his son circumcised? What does that mean? Moses is 80 years old and his son has not been circumcised? What does that show about Moses's? adherence to the Abrahamic covenant and respect of God's commands. Now, if God's going to send this man, which I think is representative of the feet that bring the good news, if God is going to send this man to bring redemption by the hand of God to the nation of Israel, how could God use a man that doesn't even respect his commands and his sign and his covenant with Abraham? So this is a very big deal. And now again, remember to be cut off from the people I think refers to not just being removed from the nation, but dying. So the cost of life, just like here, Israel not being set free, Pharaoh's son's life and the lives of the firstborn in Egypt are the price. So in the covenant with Abraham, you don't respect this covenant and the sign. You don't show that you're a part of this nation and the people of God. You're removed. So the, the cost to be a part of this is the removal of flesh involving some kind of wound and blood. I think in here we see a type, an image of the gospel of sorts. But Zipporah calls him a bridegroom of blood because if Moses is going to be, if Moses is respecting the covenant between Abraham and his offspring, he's in a covenant with God. I'm going to write this down right here. Moses is a part of that covenant with Abraham and God through the circumcision. To, disres- to dishonor that by not circumcising his son is like he said to break the covenant, at least on the part of the son, right? So this would have cost Moses his firstborn son, but instead God was coming for Moses because Moses knew better. And Moses did not honor the covenant and the sign to be a part of the people of Abraham and to be a true descendant of Abraham. So he has covenant with Abraham and God on the, you know, 
Moses descends from Abraham. And if Zipporah is the bride of Moses, then he's a bridegroom of blood to her. In other words, his covenant with Abraham ends up causing blood to be shed in their family, which makes him being in covenant with Zipporah, a bridegroom of blood. It's here, it's this here, this clashing of covenants. Since you're in covenantal marriage with Zipporah, she's brought into this covenant with Abraham, which actually requires the loss of blood and the foreskin to be removed from the son. I think all we have here is a picture of God sparing one, right? With the blood being shed of another and the foreskin being removed, you know, which I think goes deeper than just the physical removal of something outward. But the death was spared. In other words, he was oh, he was spared from death. Moses is alive. What we'll see with Pharaoh is that blood is shed to set the Israelites as the firstborn free. When Pharaoh could have avoided that and just did what God said. Now again, if God's going to call Moses to be the feet who bring this good news and who lead the people out of Egypt, Moses is going to have to actually respect the covenant and the terms and the eventually the laws God gives. And this is a big deal. So circumcision is the sign of the very covenant that God made with Abraham and his offspring. And the Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he went and met him at the mountain of God and kissed him. Because remember, God told uh, Moses that he would send Aaron. That Aaron would come and be the voice and the mouthpiece. That's fine. So because of this, Moses is spared. And now Aaron comes. We don't know if Aaron would have come or if Moses would have been spared. God just sought to remove Moses because he did say, you violate this covenant with me and Abraham. You're removed from the land of living. You're cut off from the people, however you say it. But Zipporah catches this, knows about it enough to know what it is that God is requiring of Moses. And then God sends Aaron to be the mouthpiece that Moses would use to um, be to go to Pharaoh. So I wonder if in this there, there is a picture of life being spared because of the shedding of blood Jesus sheds his blood, life, death, resurrection, and then he commissions those who will be mouthpieces of him to bring liberation and redemption to people, Jews and Gentiles. And Aaron ends up being this mouthpiece after Zipporah steps in. It's interesting, Moses is is not a shady guy, but he doesn't end up being a fantastic uh, covenant-honoring fella up to this point, at least. So I think the, the, the point of this narrative is is to bring all of these ideas together. The firstborn, the blood, the covenant, the redemption, um, the death, all these ideas in this small story. Did God intend to? Yeah, just like we'll see in Mount Sinai, God intends to destroy Israel, but Moses steps in. And God, having foreknowledge, knows that Moses will appeal and God will act mercifully. And here's the first image of that in Moses himself being spared from death, and eventually Israel spared from death. And I think this moment might have even marked Moses to act as that sort of mediator to say, how, how can I prevent this wrath from coming upon the people? And all these different things. You could bring all these connections together, but that's as far as I want to take it today, is that I believe what's happening here is God intends to put him to death to make a statement about how serious this covenant is, how serious Moses needs to take that the signs and eventually the Torah and the commands that come from God and the, the idea of redemption and firstborn and all this in this small story. It's almost like a glimpse into um, what's going to happen after all the signs and wonders take place and they're rescued from Egypt. It's like a, a mini version of that. Let me know your thoughts and uh, maybe even questions in the comments if I wasn't clear. Just some things to meditate on and think through. And look, if you want to learn how to read the Bible and study the scriptures, um, check out our free 40-day Bible study program linked in the description below. It's free, it's online, it's self-paced, um, and we have more online courses that are completely free, which you can check out at AboveReproachMinistry.com. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you haven't already subscribed, go ahead and do that and hit the bell so you can be notified of any future videos that come out. And check out AboveReproachMinistry.com. We have completely free Bible study courses, a 40-day program, a 27-day and 11-day program, all kinds of free resources. You can get a copy of my book. You can join our online church. You can get some merch. We have a bunch of stuff at AboveReproachMinistry.com. And it's also linked in the description below. Go check that out. And thanks for watching.